So hello, I hope that this works. So uh, welcome for this presentation. So first of all, I would start, uh, how many of you are familiar with aspect-oriented design or aspect-oriented programming? I see a few of you. So most of you are using what? Object-oriented programming or some functional programming? Well, most likely. So I will be introducing today some alternative approach, how to develop user interfaces. We currently use this approach in one larger system, and it was mostly because we found some issues in object-oriented programming or in functional programming or in whatever that is currently available. Uh, when we are designing user interface, it is very painful. It takes us a lot of time to do the code, but second of all, it takes us a lot of time to maintain it. So what we want, we want to be a small team, we want to make some small changes, let's say in a back end, and what we would love to have, the front end to automatically adjust to uh, the changes that were made in the back end. And maybe this is one of the approaches that could solve the problem. So I will start slowly uh, from the part where we, what we are used to with three-tier uh, application development or three-layered application development, and slowly we will be getting step by step until we will uh, see some parts of our framework. <clears throat> so what we are familiar with, I will be basing that most of you already know something about Java Enterprise Architecture. So it builds on three layers. It doesn't matter if you have there four or five layers. So let's say we have some kind of cake. But what we know, what we have may, may heard from some literature is that there exist cross-cutting concerns. So cross-cutting concerns, what could it be? Well, that's something that crosses these layers down to up. And if you want to capture it in this three-layer uh, architecture, we have to write some code in each layer, which is complicated. Because if you want to change it, we don't go to a single location. We have to go to three locations and change it there. So we will end up with some cake that really is melted together. And we don't want that. We want something that is very easy to see, that is very easy to maintain. So most likely when we talk about uh, cross-cutting concerns, you see some kind of picture like this. So when you open a textbook, you will see three layers, and there is some crossing interest, some concern, that really needs to go through all these three layers. So most likely, current solutions to this are, there are some interceptors, there are some annotations, etc., etc. But we would like to look more into detail, how would we do that for user interface? So what do we need to carry on? So when we have object-oriented approach, they have problems with restated information. They have problems with uh, cross-cutting concerns. So basically, they don't know how to solve it. They can solve two concerns cross-cutting, but they cannot solve multiple concerns. I will later show you an image that will nicely visualize it. <clears throat> so these two things are the point we try to solve. So let's say we want some demo. So we've, uh, we have this three-tier application. On the bottom layer, we have some data. We have some interaction. Uh, both these are defining somehow our user interface. So we will focus on visualization of data. We have some kind of form. And certainly, this form is bound to the data that we have down in the bottom layer. What do we need to care about as well? A layout. How this data will be presented to the user? How big screen he has? What next? Well, maybe we need to uh, be concerned with security. Does the user really can see it, cannot see it? And in user interface, we still have to capture it because we have to mimic what the system allows the user to see and what doesn't. What next? Well, maybe we would like to use there some validation. And you know, I always just show you a fragment. How do we extend the initial presentation? But if we try to put even more presentations, then what do we end up? This uh, fragment of code is getting more and more complicated. So if we want to capture multiple of those, let's say we have a fragment that really is melt of these different concerns, these different points of interest that we have that we want to solve. So if we want to, uh, let's say, modify something or have multiple of presentations, multiple of layouts, we have to multiply our source code. And we don't want to maintain it because we are lazy developers, most of us. So what's the problem? System evolution means that we have to refer to this tangled code to multiple places, and we are like uh, disturbed by the other concerns that didn't change. But the programming, the current way how we do that with object-oriented programming, etc., is really using it in one-dimensional space. <clears throat> 
Let's look at it from a little bit different perspective, and we will demonstrate the worst uh, possible issue. So we have, again, the same binding to the bottom layers. We have the same forms. Now we would like to capture the security. It really cross-cuts multiple layers in our application. Now we want to do layout, so we need to add additional source code. We want to put their addition presentation. Well, also for the layout, we need to put the additional presentation, so we have already quite a lot of uh, source code for the user interface. Now a change comes, and of course we have to change manually all those. We don't want to do that, right? We want to do one change, and we want this change to propagate to all the other sources. <coughs> so what, what do we, uh, how do we summarize this? So these concerns that I was describing, these few five concerns, validation, presentation, and so on, they are certainly in different dimensions. So we can say they are orthogonal. We can think of them individually. But if we want to capture it in the source code, we cannot do that because source code of object-oriented programming really gives us just single dimension. So all these different dimensions collapse into a single one. So now let's look at this picture. So we have a form. We have demonstration of the different concerns we have, such as data binding, such as validation, security, layout, presentation, etc. And if you look at it, Let's look at the left side. These are concerns in different dimensions. But if we want to capture it by coding, we have to weave in these concerns into a single source code. And we see it's a problem. Because if we want later, let's say, maintain it or adjust it, and we just want to adjust layout, we can hardly separate the layout from this source code that mixes all these things together. So we need to look at it from some perspective where we are actually able to capture these concerns this way, not that way. And that's not going to be object-oriented. So individual concerns can be seen that as the, uh, if they collapse into a single dimension of space. And this is something what you can find in the literature. This is not something I made up. I'm just representing what I read in the literature. And I will try to put it in the user interface. So the outcome from this is that currently we have tangled code. We have something that is hard to read. That's the tangled code. And we have something that is hard to maintain. <clears throat> so main points of object-oriented approach. So we want to capture these concerts separately in the different dimensions. Uh, in our case, we have their presentation, layout, binding, validation, etc. We can think of others. Let's say loca location of the user. Then we want to weave these concerns together. And most often, we do this through some precompiler that is called Aspect Weaver. So there exist Aspect J and etc. other frameworks, or HyperJ, and they do this uh, cross-cutting for you, this weaving. So we want to take the data structure, the data representation, as the main source. Because if you add a field to your system, you most likely add it here, then you add it to database, and then you add it to user interface, then you add it to some business logic. So we want this location to be the main source of information. So we want to read the information for user interface from here. So we need to do some data structure inspection. As next, we want to say that uh, there is really just a single source of information. We don't want the decision to be distributed on multiple places. So let's look at the life cycle. How could it look uh, like? This will be really just abstract, some boring stuff. Later, we will look at how it works in practice. So the first step of the life cycle is that we want to render some page. So we will see some fragment, and we say we want to render this data in the user interface. Then we say, OK, we got the data. We want to issue uh, inspection on this data. Once we have it, we will harvest from this data some join points. This is some term defined by the aspect-oriented programming. And we will use these join points to continue the development. And of course, we can take these join points from the data structures, but also from your application context. For example, who is logged in, what user rights he has. So then we will take this information that we just harvested from the inspection, and we will try to transform them. And the transformation is not going to be easy, so it will have three stages. So for each field that we uh, currently inspected from the data, we want to select a presentation template. So there will be some templating, which we'll be using to uh, put in the data that are uh, relevant towards given data instance, and then interpret the given template based on what the data contain. <clears throat> As next, we might apply layout. So it's additional point that might be concerning us. And the last point is integration to the user interface. So let's say you are using JSF, as defined by the uh, Java Enterprise Edition standard. So we want to integrate it into it. 
So how do we do that? So we develop this framework. So finally, we are getting into something more concrete. We are developing it quite long. Currently, it has uh, LPGL license. If you look in the history, uh, the LPGL li license got there recently. <coughs> It is uh, available at aspectfaces.com. We currently have uh, Confluence for documentation, and my colleague did a really decent job on doing a great documentation. So it's already documented. We have public Jira available. If you will get it for free, we'll see in a couple of days. Uh, source code is available, so you can actually go and look the comments that it's, uh, it's alive, and you will see, and you can, you can do your own pull request. And we have a Maven, so to make it easier for you that you will really just put some information to the POM file. <clears throat> so what do we support? Well, basically, if you have Java, you're compatible with us. And then it's your interest what you want to use it for. So we have some plugins for Java Enterprise Edition. Most likely, there will be, you will be interested in something you already have, some existing application. So there will be validations for Hibernate, validations for anything. If you will come up with your own validations and you want to use them for this process of transformation, you can do that. <clears throat> and then, well, we most likely focused on JSF, so we can choose if you want prime faces, rich faces, whatever else, and you don't need to. You can use just HTML or something else. So let's look how, it, uh, how as a developer, I would do that. So I have some basic source code. You see that there is some strange tag, aspect faces, user interface, and I'm passing there an instance. So it's the instance that some controller gives me. So what do I do? I, I will take this instance and I will try to inspect it. I want to know what it is. So I will look at it. I will certainly use some reflective API. I'll look into that. But don't worry, it's not going to be slow because we will cache it. And we will look at what? We will look at information about the structure. So we know this is a person. We will define some structural model. You can see on the uh, right side. And then we are looking at each field and at the annotation. So we see there is field. We see there are some annotations. And these annotations have some properties. And we are building a really small structural model as well for the next field, next field, etc. So what next? Uh, you are wondering, what do you inspect? Everything. If you have your own annotation, just write a descriptor, and it will, it will work. It's four lines of code. <clears throat> if you want to put there some runtime information, you can as well. You can basically put there whatever context you want. So if you want to detect where the user is from by IP address, you know where is he from. And based on that, you will display him state, information field, or no, etc. So then when we have harvested this information, we want to transform it into user interface. So what do we do? We need to select some template in which we want to put this information that we just harvested, this validation criteria, this uh, constraints, etc. So it will look similar to what you would be normally writing, some label, some output, some input, whatever. But if you will notice, there are some strange uh, tags in it, some strange markup. So we can look into that. So first of all, this uh, presentation template defines us how it will look like in the user interface. And then it is concerned with the information. So we are addressing the structural model that we just harvested. So there exists some syntactic sugar. There exists some variables that we just harvested that are from the structure or from the, from the context. And we will be looking. Uh, with interpretation of this template to interpret this information. So what do you see between these dollars? If you don't like dollars, you can redefine it to something else, is uh, expression language. We use Joel, and if you have your application, we use uh, standard JSF expression language. So you can put there any, anything. You can put there logical combination, arithmetical combinations. You can call function, whatever you put in the context. <coughs> so. I just introduced shortly what is a template. But uh, the main part of this slide is how do we select this template? So someone here familiar with MetaWidget? No one? OK, good. <clears throat> so what uh, normal uh, frameworks do, they will provide you a mapping one-to-one. -one. So basically, you will say, I want to put for this field this uh, output. But we don't want to do that, because it would be repetition. So we want to be more generic. So we will define generic rules how to select a template to use for a given structural information. How does uh, such a transformation look like? Well, you can write some small mapping rules. These mapping rules will be, again, relevant to the structure. And of course, you don't have that many annotations in your system. You are always reusing 
hibernate validation. You are always using Java types. So you can base on the Java types. You can base on some annotation that is email, or you can make your own annotation, or you can make annotation password. And based on that, you make a decision what kind of template it is. So you might think this might be hard, but later I will present you that for our application that is quite large, we have only 28 these rules, and we cover the whole application, the whole system. So we can really reuse this mapping. So now let's look, once we select such a template based on some information, <clears throat> Uh, how do we, what do we do with it? So certainly I said we will be interpreting these fields. So on the top I put the uh, class that we want to display in the user interface, the instance. And now I will be looking in uh, where this field goes. I will be looking for the others. This goes to the uh, annotations and their uh, options. And basically we will get something you would normally write by yourself. But you get it by machine. It doesn't make mistakes. It doesn't make inconsistencies. So you will always be assured that it's correct. So this information will always reflect what you have in the uh, backend. If you change it by JRebel, it will change it too, if you are in a debug mode. <clears throat> if you want to put it in production, it will not look up, it will cache it. So we want to put our layout. Basically, what approach you would choose for a layout? You would do XSLT, right? Some transformation with XSL. Well, we could do that, but we would like to be more efficient. Behind uh, use sits one guy that actually designed this. So we call it compressed uh, transformation of X, uh, XSLT. Uh, basically, the advantage is that you don't need to enumerate all the fields. You put their anonymous field, and you say, for all those anonymous fields, I want them to repeat as many times as necessary. You put there some condition, and they will be filling this pattern. But you can also refer some specific field. These specific fields will be there, uh, placed as first, so they will not occur in the iteration. So basic examples. You are a developer. You want quick content. You don't want to do much coding. So if you want to use Java server faces, which I hope you're familiar with, so basically you, all you would need to do is to point to some instance that is available in your context. You say, I want it editable. And if you use the default templates we have there, you will get this result. If you will say, at the same time, I would like to have there some layout that will be predefined to have two columns, you will get something like that. It's similar to the slide I was showing you. There is the notes, and there is all the other fields, whatever. We can redefine it as we wish. If you would like to uh, restrict uh, the form to display only some fields, you will say, ignore something. Don't worry. It will not show you version. It will not show you ID. It has a global configuration, and you can put all those fields that will be ignored by default because they are internal. Uh, what next? I might select some fields that are read-only and some fields that are not read-only. I can select it from the context outside as a developer. So it's on me to really specify what I want to see or not. You can put there some, uh, something that will be evaluable. You don't need to do it by yourself. <clears throat> you can put it as read-only. You can do the same trick and define tables. Uh, the only uh, necessary thing is to enumerate the type, because when we are in the table, we don't know the context. So basically, you can define all the data visualization in user interface. We don't deal with navigation. Uh, now the production experience, because maybe you were like, maybe it's interesting, but it will not work. We have it working in this uh, system since 2007. What is this system? This is programming contest. We have, I don't know, 30,000 students a year from 90 countries. So it's accessed from all the users from 2,200 universities. So they are distributed, and the system is not slow. It works for them. We have it there for a long time, and it works. So what are uh, some specifications of the system? We have 70 classes. I did this statistics half year ago. Now, now we have about 90, so we grown a little bit. Uh, we are using aspect faces, and they on demand generate a form. If you go to this website, if you type ACMI CPC and you go to register, all those forms are registered by aspect faces. And if you select the different size of your screen, it will adjust the layout for you. <clears throat> so we use aspect faces for all the forms that we have there. We have only tw uh, 28 mappings and uh, templates for the entire system for 70 data classes for about 400 fields only. It reduces to this. If you want to 
let's say, do something strange in some situation, you will define new template, you will define new mapping. But as you see, this is a working, living application, and there's only 28 mapping rules. So we covered the entire system. What are the benefits? Well, uh, at one time, we were porting from rich faces to prime faces. I hope the uh, redhead people will not kill me. But what do we needed to do? We needed to do to change these 28 uh, templates. And we were compatible with prime faces. Now, think you have system with 70 classes, and you want to port it from rich faces to prime faces. You would have to go to a tremendous amount of code to change it. How did we measure that it would be tremendous? Because we use aspect faces for forms. We don't use it for tables. So tables took us like three months to uh, transform. Uh, forms were done within one day. Uh, pretty much uh, the benefit we have, one fix fixes all. So if we will find out there is some validation error uh, on client side, we will go, we'll fix it, and all the forms are fixed. <clears throat> Whatever else, we want to fix presentation, etc. So we have centralized decision. The entity becomes to be the source of information for this transformation. We never got UI inconsistency that we would have different data in the back end and different data in user interface. Well, we got it with the database because we don't have the mapping switched on. We don't want to do that manually, but we didn't get it with user interface. So that's, that's pretty neat because this error can happen mostly when you have two developers. One is responsible for back end and one is responsible for front end. So no problems like that. Uh, all data changes will immediately appear in uh, your application. So we most likely develop with JRebel. I don't, I don't see any guy from JRebel here. Uh, in past, in Prague, they were passing some free licenses, but now we have the social license. So you are developing, you are a developer, you add some field, and it populates in your form, and you don't need to do anything. You just add four lines of code in Java. Uh, Something specific in this application, uh, you're familiar with annotation not null, not empty. But what if we want to relax this rule? We, we want to say that we want this information from user, but he doesn't need to specify it now. He can specify it later. So we came up in this system with annotation needed. It works similar like required, but we allow to submit this form, but we don't annotate this data instance as complete but we will be pestering user by email as long as he didn't fill out a field that is needed. And it was very easy to integrate it. Basically, we wrote one lookup on uh, the entity if it has the needed, and then we propagated in the entire user interface this needed annotation through the aspect faces. So it is nice, smooth integration, and this is example that you can come up with your own annotations and play with your system, and the change will take effect immediately and everywhere. Now, some nice statistics, which took me quite a lot of time. So when I was measuring the system, it has 70 classes, about 470 fields. Uh, it has, you can measure it, there exist a lot of tools how to measure source code. Uh, 77,000 lines of code of Java, and regards user interface, we have 60,000 lines of code. It's terrible to uh, be maintaining it. So with aspect faces, we get 20,000, 21,000 for free because they are generated. So we need to maintain only 40,000 lines of code in XHTML. Uh, let me remind you, it has very weak type safety. So with aspect faces, you don't have errors. So if you look into how many restated information we reduced, because all those forms are generated, we restated about 15,000 restated information. So if they change, they change in the user interface. You don't need to maintain it. Normally, you would have to do that by hand. <coughs> So approximately 32% of UI code is generated, which is, which is quite nice. You don't need to do that as a developer. Regards performance, we improved over the last year when we were presenting here. So on a five forms with 21 fields, over 250 samples, that basic JSF form, you get approximately on the server wheel measuring it 545 milliseconds. With the aspect faces, you get very similar time because we are pretty much hooked into facelets and into the same components. <clears throat> so I would love to spend with you a few more hours, tell you all the features, but we don't have time, so I will enumerate some of those interesting things. And I think after me here are some uh, people presenting uh, drools, 
one of my colleague is trying to uh, integrate the rules into this. So it will not only cover the static part, but also the dynamic part. So certainly you get reduction of coding. I think I shown enough on the previous slide. You get reduction of restatement. You get separation of concerns. You can come up with your own concerns, and they are integrated through the templates, because you will point the template to look it up somewhere. Uh, you can get adaptive UIs. You can really adjust the user interface. You can detect by camera that you are communicating with Kit, and you will present them different user interface, and it doesn't cost you that much, because all you need to do is define 28 templates, which is not really that costly. Then you can detect that the user has small screen. You will really present him a small layout. He has big screen, so you will put him a large layout, and you can make custom layouts. It's whatever you can imagine, but uh, with low costs. Uh, it's fast. So you don't get any decrease on the speed compared to JSF. You have generic uh, transformation rules. This is what I'm selling here today, the generic transformation rules. You don't want to do that manually because human factor is mm, not 100% correct always. There is always some coffee that is on, on the keyboard, right? <clears throat> uh, you can ignore some fields that you don't want to show ever in user interface. You will annotate a field that is password, and it will not show in the user interface. It will only show as a secret. Uh, it's security aware. You can integrate uh, this information with annotations that already exist, and you will just say, I want these fields to show to admin. I want these fields to show to the user. So it supports role-based access control. Uh, you can define profiles for different use if you want to present it in a form that is for uh, harvesting data or if you want to get it in a form that is for searches. So you can pretty much just say, this huge class, just subset of this I want to present here, subset of this I can present here. You can eliminate fields. You can modify this generic transformation by uh, accessing it. It has automated change propagation. What you change, it immediately uh, occurs in the user interface. You can completely adjust it to what you want. If you will use some alternative product, you cannot do that. They don't have templates. So this is the second thing I'm selling here. Because they, when you will go and you will use some alternative product, you will only get what it is predefined with. And if you want to change it, you can hardly do that. So most of the users of such tools will end up with writing it manually eventually. With us, you can do really what you want. You will get what you want. You can integrate pretty much your own context, your own annotations. What next? Uh, you can define your new concern that is specific to your system. You are not bound to JSF. You can use it. Whatever, it's free. That was last year's question. I'm hopefully I'm satisfied this year. <clears throat> it allows you to stream concerns separately. So I was sitting there with Irka at the university, and he says, it would be great if we wouldn't have JSF. I don't know how many of you would agree or not. Because I hate JSF, I would really just like to have REST services. Well, I tried to pull down REST services, and basically you can stream to the client each uh, aspect each concern separately and compose them at the client side. Well, you will get a lot of benefits because you can cache structural information, you can cache the HTML, and all you need to send is the information about the data instance. So basically, in my prototype, I did REST web service for data structure, REST service for data instance, and then uh, at client side, some basic weaver with uh, JavaScript. Those two things can be cached. Normally, you cannot. When you stream JSF, you stream all this information always over and over and over. So if you have their, let's say, class field, class um, value, you always have to send it multiple times. So it generates a lot of traffic. So if we generate this at uh, the client side and we compare it with the same for with the prime faces, this is really just a prototype. So this is something that we are forecasting. So if we compare web page with prime faces with a web page with uh, the aspect faces prototype the aspect faces prototype saves you uh, what is being transmitted between server side and client side when you switch on caching on a browser it is even more evident so when i did some uh, uh, evaluation with prime faces uh, you need to load from the server side 11 kilobytes with this approach you would only download 2.5 kilobytes. So it's interesting, and maybe this is some challenge for JSF. So quick configuration. Maybe you were interested, and now you're saying that will be painful to integrate it in my system. So this is what you want to use. 
Uh, if you will fetch our library from Maven, which, as you will see later, all you need to do is to register a uh, listener. Based on that, we will initiate uh, and we will initialize all the context. Then you need to say, I want to use the taglib. That was the AF that you saw there on the first, first slide above. <clears throat> then, of course, you can write your own mapping, or you can use the one that we are providing. You can write your own uh, templates. And the last thing is you have to point to our repository. Uh, while it's online, you never had problem with the uh, production systems with this repository. <clears throat> All you need to do is to really just write those six lines and uh, refer it to this repository, and you get it. But more likely, you will be interested to look into the source code. I have to warn you, in two hours, Big Bucket has some planned outage. So if you want to do that, do it now or tomorrow. Uh, so the last thing uh, is a recapitulation of the links. So this is a technology that we are trying to still develop. Well, we have multiple colleagues working on it. We have interest to putting it in that system that is working. And we also have there some like a dissertation topics that we want to demonstrate on it. And so far, we are quite beating the existing approaches for adaptive user systems with it also. You can look in the documentation. And uh, the documentation now is exactly as it's supposed to be. So you will see good examples there. And uh, you, don't, you can see more information, but it doesn't give you necessarily in the intro, intro parts uh, what's necessary, uh, what, what's, what you would call too much. You can report some JIRA. You can certainly contribute, and we would be happy if you contribute. You can try it. You can mail us, and we can guide you. Uh, all you need to do is to use our Maven. So this is basically all I had today for you. My student said, don't put more slides. I know I speak very fast, but I tried not to. And now we gain some time for questions. So I'm happy to answer anything you ask. Well, uh, table, yeah, let me repeat the question. So in, the, in this application, why did we use forms and why we didn't use tables? Well, basically, we have from these 30,000 users so many requests that we have a huge stack of uh, tasks that we are working on. So this is on the feature list that we have. But there is also email reminders. There is some uh, questionnaires, etc. Basically, what you do at this conference as well. So it's on our list. And we didn't get to that point yet. So some other question. If this answered. I, I wish to uh, give you a more satisfactory answer. But there is four people, and we really have a lot of, lot of requests. Mm -hmm. What are competing solutions for the same problem? So uh, I, would, I would answer two ways. I would first um, try to adjust the aspect-oriented picture and then the alternative products. <clears throat> so the seeing of aspect-oriented programming has really two mainstreams. One of them is aspect-J, what you see with Spring, etc., And one of them is a hyper-J. The hyper-J is more about uh, integration. Aspect J is more about runtime integration of some information. So in this approach, you cannot compare it directly with Aspect J, because Aspect J is you are calling something and you fetch something. But aspect-oriented programming, if you look at the source written by the author in 1997, he says, what we want to do, we want to define separate aspects and through the aspect weaver to combine them together. So if we will look at this original definition, this is what we are trying to do. So we don't necessarily need to put there any uh, proxy objects, et cetera, as it is done, let's say, with security, with uh, Aspect J or with uh, Spring AOP. So this is a little bit different uh, approach to do this. And you can see what you, what you would compare with uh, the Spring AOP. 
uh, here in the template. So normally you do annotation with string, uh, Spring AOP. Here you see the template that has this expression language, and this is where you are defining the uh, concern integration. So basically you can see that as a point cut over there, and as an advice is the result, which might be some text value, most likely. So uh, this would be more detailed answer, which I don't know uh, if uh, I could provide now. And the second question, if we have some alternative products, well, one of them is MetaWidget. MetaWidget is uh, from Kernard from Australia. He had it as a PhD work. Uh, what's the difference? He doesn't have the generic approach. He doesn't have the transformation rules, these 28 which we had. Basically, he has one-to-one. -one. Each field is directly mapped into text field or into something. Uh, I've shown you that these three 467 fields only need 28 rules. In his case, he would have 467 rules. Uh, next thing is that he allows you to use rich faces, prime faces, whatever, but you're really getting bound to his implementation of it. So if he says, here is layout, here is the value, you will always have here layout and here value. With our approach, you are defining it in the template. So you can put the layout here, value on the other side. You can put the layout on the top. You can adjust it to what you want. That would be the main difference. I don't see many other alternative products. Well, certainly the first idea would be, but I saw this in, in Eclipse, right? You can generate user interfaces in Eclipse. Well, no. This is, this is too basic what Eclipse does. Uh, basically, you will end up with writing it your, on your own because it has one-way propagation and the other direction, the reverse propagation, is so trivial. When you put it as some more advanced construct, it's not able to uh, get it back into the visualization. So really, the only alternative comparable product would be this. Or at the SIEM forum, which was the old forum for SIEM2, there was also mentioned naked objects from Ireland. Uh, they used similar approach with annotating data and uh, designing some information systems for the government. They were quite successful with that. But again, they only used some direct rules. They didn't have the like a middle area of the, of the mapping. So this would be perhaps the two closest products that you could find. So I don't know if this satisfied your question. So what you do is basically not Mm -hmm. Because uh, you have these rules, you are not annotating data. Uh, you have rules, and uh, these rules need to handle the data. That's correct. So the question was if uh, we are not using the data-driven approach because we are not annotating the data, and that's correct. We are annotating just uh, the semantics of the data, and then with the transformation, we can choose independently how do we want to transform. So once you annotate the data, you can have uh, thousands of different mappings into the user interface, and you can change it. The advantage is that if you would decide with this data-driven approach to change the visualization, you would have to go to data and modify them each by each. Here, you only need to define new rule. You will give it higher priority and immediately takes effect on thousands of data. That's the, that's the advantage. So some other questions? You can do that. You can, as you saw there, uh, we, uh, all you need to do is to use facelet-like templates. You can define your own components. So let's say my cool component, whatever, whatever, here are the properties. You will define in the template uh, what you want there from the data, and you will get the result. So you can adjust it. You couldn't do this with the alternative products because it would be painful. They don't have the uh, templates. Here you say, I have three great components, and the rest of them I want to use from JSF. You can, you can integrate uh, whatever, whatever components you want. Yeah. So basically, you can see that what this does, it will uh, give you a result in JSF, and then it compiles it on runtime for you. So whatever you can do in JSF, you can do with this as well. So some other question. So if there are no questions, thank you for your attention. And don't forget to. Oh, for sure.
Yes, I have. I have actually now two opened uh, diploma. Uh, so the question is if it's possible to use it for the client. So uh, I have two students. One is integrating it for uh, cell phone, uh, Android. The other one is integra integrating it for uh, Swing. And there exists actually a lot of nice libraries like Swix, etc., which are trying to do something, although they don't have the mapping. But I think better approach would be really have the server side streaming this REST uh, web services information and then just building it based on that. And this is already possible with the, uh, with the uh, system that I was referring to. So I have here a mark out of time. So if there is some last qu a quick question, we could do that. If not, then thank you for your attention again. And uh, don't forget to uh, drop us some note if you will try that. Thank you. Teď si nám tu vodu. <laughs> děkuji, děkuji. To je super. Já mám, protože mě, mě přišel ten student, jeden, co tady byl, furt říkal, ty jsi drmolil, ty jsi tam říkal věci, které tam neměly být, tak mi napsal outline, jak on by si, jak by si to představoval jako developer. Přesně jsem to měl podle outlineu. Poslal jsem mu 36 slajdů, 10. No, jasně. A tak já jsem tady byl poprvé, že jsem nevěděl, do čeho přesně mám zapadnout. Teď už jsem trošku viděl, ale furt to bylo oproti tam, u koncu tady byl před náma, ukázky. Jo.